ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا مزيدا اما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي indeed all praises to allah we praise him and we thank him and we seek refuge with allah from the evils of ourselves and from the evils of our actions indeed he whom allah guides then there is none to misguide and he whom Allah leaves to stray, then there is none to guide. And I be witness that none has a right to be worshipped except Allah alone, having no partner. And I be witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and messenger. To proceed, the best of speech is the book of Allah, and the best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the worst of affairs are the newly invented matters, for every newly invented matter is an innovation, and every innovation is misguided, and all that misguides leads only to the hellfire. We have to remember Allah says to us in the Quran, Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu attaqu Allah haqqa tuqati, like the Imam read in the Salah. Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu, Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu attaqu Allah haqqa tuqati. O oh, you who believe, O oh, you who say la ilaha illallah, O oh, you who say that you are Muslim, fear Allah. Then Allah says haqqa tuqati, the way Allah deserves to be feared. Fear Allah, the way Allah deserves to be feared. The Prophet used to often, when he spoke, would mention this ayah of the Quran. Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu attaqul haqqa tuqati wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Fear Allah as he deserves to be feared and do not die except in a state submitted to Allah. Okay, we all know, we all know the reward of seeking knowledge. The Prophet said, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ وَمُسْلِمَةٍ In a hadith. That seeking knowledge is an obligation, fariza, upon every male and female believer or Muslim. In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ didn't say wajib. He said fariza, fariza. That it's even more above wajib. It's even more obligatory upon us to learn. And some scholars actually say that the Prophet ﷺ said fariza to show that it's actually and it should be an act of worship. The faraid are things that we must do which are acts of worship that must be do- done solely for Allah's sake. So by the Prophet ﷺ saying fariza, he's saying that this knowledge it's not only obligatory, but it must be done as a worship to Allah. That's what ilm actually is, learning knowledge. It should be done as a worship of Allah. And we know all the ahadith and we know all the sayings of the scholars about knowledge. So I don't, I don't want to go through all of that. I'll just mention one hadith from Muslim. That the person who wants to seek, the person who goes out, Seeking knowledge that Allah makes easy for him a path to paradise. What else do we want apart from paradise? So Prophet said, the one who goes out seeking knowledge, Allah makes easy for him a path to paradise. And the angels put their, their wings down for him. And the whales or the fish in the sea seek forgiveness for him. What else do we want? This is about seeking knowledge. But the knowledge that has to be sought has to be for the sake of Allah. Has to be for the sake of Allah alone. Ala lillahi dinul khalis. Indeed, to Allah belongs sincerity, the religion in sincerity. The only knowledge that will benefit is knowledge by which you seek Allah's face. Knowledge by which you want to remove ignorance from yourself to pl- please Allah and enter His paradise. That's the only knowledge that will benefit. 
What is the point of learning and learning and learning when none of it is for the sake of Allah? Allah doesn't want that knowledge. Allah wants the knowledge by which you seek Allah's reward. You don't want to show off. You don't want anything. You don't want the praise of the people. You don't want anything from anyone. All you want is the pleasure of Allah. The only reason you do it is as a worship of Allah. And that's probably the hardest thing to do. To seek this knowledge. Seeking the pleasure of Allah and His reward. Sometimes somebody may spend his whole life seeking knowledge. His whole life seeking knowledge. And it hasn't been for the sake of Allah. Remember that hadith of Sahih Muslim. That the first three people will be thrown into hellfire. One of them is Qari al-Qur'an. is the reciter of the Qur'an. Meaning one with knowledge. And he will, and Allah will ask him, what did you do? He said, I read the Qur'an. I taught the Qur'an. I stood at night praying with the Qur'an. For your sake. And Allah said, you lie. You lie. You did it. So the people would say, to you, say of you, you are knowledgeable. You did it for the people, not for my sake. And so he will be thrown into the hellfire. He spent his whole life, subhanAllah, just think about the hadith. He spent his whole life learning the knowledge, teaching the knowledge. Not only that, standing at night reading Quran, but not for the sake of Allah. And not for the sake of Allah. And so Allah threw him into the hellfire. Allah lillahi deen al khalis. Allah doesn't accept any action. Unless it is sincerely for his sake. It's easy for me to say all of this. But it's harder for one to do. Prophet Sallallahu said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Indeed actions are by their intention. And every person will get that which, he, that which he intended. So if somebody seeks knowledge to to be for people to say that he is knowledgeable, he will get that maybe in this dunya. But he will have nothing in the akhirah. If he seeks knowledge so he can debate with the people and show them that he is at the top, he may get that, but he will have nothing in the hereafter. The only thing, the only time knowledge will benefit you is when you seek it sincerely for the sake of Allah, as a worship of Allah, seeking the reward with Allah. Prophet ﷺ said, "Man yuridil lahu bi khayran yufakihu fi din." The one whom Allah wishes goodness for. Listen to the hadith. The hadith of uh, Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan. The one whom Allah wants good for. The one who wants, or the one whom Allah wants good for, He gives him the understanding of the religion. The one whom Allah wants good for, He gives him what a Mercedes, a big house, a big salary. A big car, a beautiful wife, lots of children. No. يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ He gives him the understanding of this, of this deen. He may have nothing of this dunya. He may live on the street. But if he has the understanding of this deen, then Allah has chosen. Allah has chosen. So think about your own self. And then think about this hadith. مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ The one whom Allah wants good for, He gives him the understanding of the religion. So weigh yourself up. Does Allah want good for you? By you being here, here inshaAllah, inshaAllah Allah wants good for you. But He wants to give you something of this deen. Some understanding of this deen. This is the first time I'm actually teaching fiqh. I've studied fiqh, but I've never taught fiqh. I've studied with the scholars different books of fiqh, but I've never taught anybody fiqh. So you're like the experiment. You guys are experiment, the first experiment. One thing that the scholars always used to say to us when we studied fiqh is you start with the simple things, the simple knowledge, before you move to the harder knowledge. And that's something that 
automatically you know. Al Bidaya Bisigari al Ilm Tabla Kibarihi. The beginning point, the starting point, it was is with the small, the simple, the easy knowledge before you move on to the harder knowledge. But we see many people that they spend a lot of time they spend studying. They spend a long time, maybe even studying one subject, and they get very little of that knowledge. They get very little of that knowledge because they didn't follow this principle. One great scholar of the Hanbali Madhab, Ibn Badran, he said when he was he wrote a book. He wrote a book. I'm trying to use correct English. Here. He wrote a book in which he explained how to study the Hanbali Madhab. He called it Al Madhal. Ila Madhab Imam Ahmed. And at the beginning of the book, he gave some advice to the students who are beginning studying the Madhab or beginning studying any knowledge. And it's some beautiful advice he gave. He said, there are, there are lots of people who spend many years learning perhaps one knowledge one science of Islamic knowledge. They spend these, all these years learning and learning and studying and studying and studying, but at the end, they gain nothing of this knowledge, or very little of this knowledge. And they spend all of this time, and all of these ages, and they still remain amongst the beginners in this field of knowledge. And there are two reasons, he says, for this. There are two reasons for this. One reason, we can do nothing about. And the other reason, we can do something about. The first reason is, he doesn't have the intellectual capacity to understand. He's not bright enough. He doesn't have the intellect. Allah hasn't blessed him to be able to understand the knowledge. He's just simple. He just wants to know, what he must do and doesn't want to know anything more than that. That's all he can ha handle. And there are people like this. They can't learn more than that. Some people, they only do secondary school and then they don't want to go to college because it's too much. Or they do up to college and then they don't want to go any further. They want to go into their degrees. Same way. This is intellectual. This is something from Allah. This is something we cannot do anything about. The second one is due to the way he studied. He studied under somebody who took him through the big books. And perhaps, for example, he gives an example that he was studying Nahu, grammar, Arabic grammar, which everybody hates. Arabic grammar, especially the Arabs. The Arabs hate Arabic grammar the most. Non-Arabs don't hate it as much, but the Arabs hate Arabic grammar. So he gives an example of Arabic grammar. He says, he studies with a sheikh who spends perhaps one month talking about Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This is grammar, remember. Just Bismillah. And all the grammar rulings about this. And then he spends another month teaching him Alhamdulillah. And everything to do with Alhamdulillah. So he's teaching him, he's showing him, the sheikh says, He's showing him, this teacher is showing the student how knowledgeable this teacher is. How much he knows, how much he's memorized. And then he moves on and he continues, continues in the same way. Showing him and taking him through the different differences of opinion on this and the opinion on this and the opinion on this. And this one said this and this one said this. And this one resp responded to this one by this. And this one responded to this one by this. So he spends his whole life doing that. To the extent that the student decides that this is too hard. I will never learn this. I will never learn this. But the correct way of learning is starting with the simple books. Learning what is in those simple books and then moving to something which is slightly bigger. So, the scholars advise that you start with something which is mukhtasar, a primer, simple book. In any science that you were to study, 
any science. For example, in school, when a, a child goes to grade, I don't know, grade six, no, grade two, for example, a child is in grade two, and he studies, and then when he moves to grade three, what happens? Do they forget everything he studied in grade two? Or do they build upon what he studied in grade two, in grade three? Come on, answer. They build upon it. So they repeat things. You learn, they repeat things that you, the, the child already knows and build upon that. If you were to take a child from grade two and just put him into grade six and say you need to study, is he going to achieve anything? No. Or is he going to sit there lost? Looking at the teacher and thinking, what are you on about? Same thing, if we take somebody from secondary school, he's doing his GCSEs, and we say, no, you're going to go and study in a master's degree level. You're going to be in a class like that. Is he going to understand anything? No. Same way Islamic knowledge is the same. You start from easy, and you learn that which is easy, simple, and then you move on to something which is slightly higher than that, in which you will repeat what you've already learnt. <coughs> because of course, once you look, say we do this book, we study this whole book, okay? How much of it are, are you going to actually remember? Once we finished it. You might remember the stuff that we just did at the end, but and maybe some of the beginning because we've gone through the Sahara and everything so many times, and you do so. But a lot of it you're going to forget. That's why you go to another book of fiqh, which is slightly bigger than this book. In which you will repeat what's in this book with some addition. So it's keeping them, it's making, helping you memorize the knowledge and keeping it there for you. Imam Ahmad rahimahullah wa radiyan, is one of the four Imams. Do we know the, the four Imams? Okay, who are they? Abu Hanifa. What's his name? What's his name? This is, Abu Hanifa is Kuniya. What's his name? Come on, the great Imam. Nu'man. Nu'man. Nu'man ibn Thabit. Then we have Imam Malik, Imam of Dar al-Hijrah, Imam of Medina, Malik ibn Anas, Malik ibn Anas. Then we have Imam who? What's his name? Ahmed bin Hanbal. We haven't got to him yet. <laughs> we'll get to him. Imam Shafi'i, Muhammad ibn Idris, Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, al-Qurayshi. Is from Quraysh. No, uh, Abu Hanifa was not from the Arabs. He was non Arab. He was from Iraq, but he was a non Arab. He's from the, what they consider Mawali, non Arabs. Imam Malik is from Medina, he's an Arab. Imam Shafi is, is from Mecca, but he was born in Gaza and he lived in. Egypt and he lived in Iraq and he lived in Mecca as well but he's Qurayshi he's from the Prophet's family and the last one Ahmed Ibn Hanbal okay Imam Imam uh, Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik were roughly around the same time okay Imam Shafi'i studied with Imam Malik at the beginning of his studies, his mother sent him to study with Imam Malik and to gain the knowledge from Imam Malik. After he finished studying with Imam Malik, he went and studied with one of the main students of Imam Abu Hanifa, Muhammad al-Shaybani. Imam Abu Hanifa had two students, two main students. The third is a student as well. But the two main were Abu Yusuf and Muhammad al-Shaybani. That's where we get the fiqh of Abu Hanifa from. Imam Shafi studied with Muhammad al-Shaybani. Imam Ahmad studied under 
Imam al-Shafi'i. All of them are connected. Even though the people who follow their madhab want to kill each other. <laughs> and in some places and in some times they actually fought to the death. And to the point that they wouldn't pray behind each other. And you're probably thinking the Hanafis, yeah, they don't want to pray behind. No, the Shafis and the Hanbali wouldn't pray behind each other. That's how bad it was, especially in Sham. The Hanbalis wouldn't pray behind the Shafis, and the Shafis wouldn't pray behind the Hanbalis, even though the, the Imams are students, one is a student of the other. Imam Shafi taught Imam Ahmed fiqh, and Imam Ahmed taught Imam Shafi hadith. But we find late, later generations, later generations, they just became staunch followers of, of the madhab, and they wanted to fight each other, and broke the deen up. That's not what we want. Imam Ahmed never wrote a book of fiqh. He never wrote any book of fiqh. The book that he wrote is a book of hadith, which is probably the biggest book of hadith that there exists. Musnad Imam Ahmed. Musnad Imam Ahmed. I think it's about 40 volumes. All hadith with Asanid. All hadith with Asanid. His fiqh was due to people asking him questions. Somebody would ask, send a question to him and he would answer it and then his students would write down his answers of what he said. And then they wrote this down into a book and said these are the opinions of Imam Ahmed. But Imam Ahmed didn't want his fiqh written down. And Imam Ahmed used to say that I don't want people to carry my fatawa to different places. Because what I believe, what I say, I believe to be correct. But it's possible that I'm wrong. What I say, what fatwa I give, I believe it to be correct based upon the Quran and the Hadith. And the sayings of the Sahaba, I believe it to be correct, but it's possible that I'm wrong. Imam Shafi used to say that there's not a person that I debated with except that I wished that person had the truth with him so that I could follow him. They weren't looking out for themselves. They wanted the truth. They wanted the people to follow the truth. When somebody said to Imam Ahmed, it's reported, so and so people in such and such land are following your statement on this issue. He said, I want you to tell them that I've changed my opinion so they don't follow me. They didn't want people to follow them. They wanted people to follow the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu upon the understanding of the Salaf al-Salih. And they were afraid. They were afraid that on the day of judgment they may be asked, these people followed you and you misguided them. These people followed you and you misguided them. But the situation for us today is everyone wants to become a mufti. Everyone wants to be the one who is asked. And nobody wants to be a follower. Everybody wants to be the one who's asked and the people look to and the people come to but no one, but hardly anybody illa man rahim Allah wants to be a follower. Like the statement is there's too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Too many chiefs, not enough Indians. One scholar, a shu'bah, he was a great muhaddith it's a bit of a funny story. He used to hate anybody to ask him questions. And he was a very stern person on top of that. So what he did, people used to come to him and ask him questions about hadith. And is this, is this authentic? Is this not authentic? What do you say about such and such person? And he didn't want to answer. Fearing the punishment with Allah. Fearing that Allah will take him to account for that. So what he did was he got a dog. 
and he had the dog at the gate of his house. So if somebody came to the house, he would set the dog on them. So nobody could ask him a question. That's how far he went to stop people to ask him questions. And he learned this from the Sahaba. Because Umar, when he used to be asked questions, he used to bring the people of Badr to give fatwa. People of Badr. This is people whom Allah chose about the rest, even above the rest of the Sahaba. Those who Badr have a place above the rest of the Sahaba. So Imam Shaba used to do this. One day, his students came and they didn't find the dog. So they managed to get to his door and they found him crying. And they said, Oh Imam, what makes you cry? He said, The one who used to order the good and forbid the evil has died. The dog died. Nobody got it. He used to order the good and forbid the evil. The dog. By stopping people asking him questions and putting him to fitna, putting him to trial. The dog died. The one who used to uh, enjoy good and forbid evil died. The dog died. This is how far they went. And you see that in some of the scholars today. You see that in the scholars today. Sometimes there are some sheikhs that I came across. If you saw them, you would never think they knew anything. They come into the masjid, they sit somewhere, do dhikr of Allah. You won't know they are the sheikh, and then they call to come and give the dafs. Simple people. Don't want to be famous. Don't want to be known. They learn the deen, they teach the deen, that's it. But not like we are, what we have today. Everybody wants to be a superstar. Allahu Akbar. Okay. As for what we're going to be studying, then this is Manhaj Salikin, <coughs> the path of the travelers. The path of the travelers. Manhaj Salikin. Uh, it was written by. Al-Sheikh Al-Allama Abdurrahman Ibn Nasr Al-Sa'di Does anybody know Al-Sa'di? Al-Allama Al-Sheikh Al-Sa'di You do know him? Anybody heard of him? He has a book of Tafsir Tafsir Al-Sa'di Simple Tafsir book No? Nobody knows him? That much? No, no This is Sheikh Sa'di from Saudi Arabia. Okay, Sheikh Sa'di, his most famous student, everybody knows them, knows his student but doesn't know him. His most famous student is Sheikh Muhammad bin Salih al Uthaymi. That's his student. That's one of his many students. And another one of his students, maybe you don't know, he wasn't as famous, is Abdullah bin Abdul Aziz ibn Aqib who became the head of the Hanabila in Saudi Arabia after the death of Abdul Rahman al-Sa'di. Head of the Hanabila. And he died recently, a few years ago. Rahimahullah. Okay, the Sheikh Abdul Rahman Nasr al-Sa'di, just going to give you a brief introduction of who he is. He was born in uh, Qasim, which is a part, it's in the middle of Saudi Arabia. Near, near the capital, a few hundred kilometers away from the capital. He was born in 1307, Hijriya. Uh, at a young age, both his parents died. His mother died when he was four years old. And his father died when he was eight years old. He grew up under the care of his father's second wife. So his stepmother, she brought him up. And under the care of his brother, Ahmed. He memorized the Quran by the age of 14. His main teacher that he learned most from was Sheikh Salih ibn Uthman, who
who was the judge of Onayza, which was the, the city in, in Qasim where he lived, or the town in Qasim where he lived, Onayza, where Ibn Uthaymeen is buried as well. Onayza, that's where Ibn Uthaymeen was as well. He learned from him most of the sciences and spent most of his time studying with the Sheikh. He started to teach himself at the age of 23. He started to teach. When he was 40, 43 years old, he became the head of Qasim. After the death of his teacher, he was given the privilege of being the head judge of Qasim. I mentioned his students, the main two, Muhammad ibn Uthaymeen, there's a whole group of them, but I'm just mentioning Muhammad ibn Uthaymeen, who took over the uh, Sheikh Abdurrahman Sa'di's masjid after the death of Sheikh Abdurrahman Sa'di. The masjid in which Sheikh Muhammad ibn Uthaymeen used to teach is the masjid of Sheikh Abdurrahman Sa'di. But he was given privilege to take over the masjid after the death of Sheikh Sa'di. Sheikh Ibn Aqil, I met Sheikh Ibn Aqil a few times. And I studied a few things from Sheikh Ibn Aqil, but he was a very old man. He was in his 90s. And subhanAllah, I walked with him from his house to the masjid. He refused, he refused for anybody to take him by car. And it was a bit of a walk to get to the masjid. He used to take his stick and walk. And he refused for anyone to even give him a hand to the masjid. He said, no, Allah will write these footsteps. And there is reward for these footsteps. And he would walk. I walked with him from his house to the masjid. And in the masjid, after praying, he would sit and do dhikr and then somebody would come and read to him. And he would sit with a book. I think the, they were doing a fawaid of Ibn Qayyim. He would open the book and the Sheikh would pull out his pen. So this is Sheikh Allam, 90 years old. Spent his whole life studying, he'd pull out his pen and the person would read and he would write down things. Benefits that he gets from what Ibn Al Qayyim has been saying. And then he would give us some benefits. And the way he used to teach is the way Abdurrahman al Sa'di used to teach. He would be in his, in his library, you'd come to him, there would be a group of students, each one would have a different book. And one by one, the students would go and sit at the Sheikh's feet and read the book that he was reading to the Sheikh. And the Sheikh would comment and he would write. And the other students would have the same book maybe and they would come write until their turn came. And then he would say, okay, next. And the next student would come and he would open a different book. And they would start, he would start reading to the Sheikh and the Sheikh would comment and people would write and so on. And this is right from Fajr until after Isha, the Sheikh would sit and teach. Even at the age of 90 years old, he would do that. Sometimes, subhanAllah, you would notice the Sheikh, I remember reading uh, Raud al-Murbit, some parts of Raud al-Murbit to the Sheikh. And he's teaching, and he's an old man, and all of a sudden he falls asleep. You know, old people, he'd fall asleep. In the middle of a sentence, he'd fall asleep. And for a few, like few seconds, maybe half a minute, he'd be asleep. And they'd wake up and carry on for where he stopped. He'd carry on. I was just amazed. <laughs> another sheikh, I remember, another sheikh, Abdurrahman al-Barraq. I went to his house. He's, he, sheikh Abdurrahman al-Barraq, is not a student of sheikh Abdurrahman Saadi. But he's of the level in knowledge, perhaps even more knowledgeable than Ibn Baz. But he was never famous. He never took any governmental position. He was just a researcher and a teacher. And he carried on the, the way of teaching of one student at a time. Went to his house once and he was teaching. Teaching uh, Ibn Kathir. And he started to fall asleep. It's after Isha now. Old man, he's in his 70, I think he was 75. And he got up, 
just to wake himself up. He got up and started slapping his thighs to wake himself up so he could continue another hour of teaching. He's not getting anything from the teaching. The Sheikh is not getting anything from the teaching. All the benefit is going to the student, but he wants to carry on. These are the, our scholars. The Sheikh Abdurrahman Sa'adi wrote over 30 books. And this is one of the first books that he wrote in the beginning. He died at the age of 69. He died at the age of 69 after giving his final dust in his masjid. He went, he, he, he was sick, he had been sick for a few years, he had been treated in Lebanon, and then he carried on teaching, came back, and then in, uh, on the 22nd of, uh, 22nd of Jamad al-Akhirah, Jamad al-Akhirah, he sat in his masjid and gave his dars, and he taught the people, and then when he, when he got up, he felt that there's something wrong. So he asked one of the students to take him by his hand and take him to his door. So they took him and a whole group of them, once the people saw that something's wrong, a whole group of them went with him, rahimahullah, to his house. As he got to the door of his house, he became unconscious. So they took him inside and the people sat around waiting to see what's going, what's happening. After some time he woke up again out of con and became conscious again. After he became conscious, he gave advice to the people and told them to fear Allah and to follow the book of Allah and to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu until he became unconscious again and never regained consciousness. Uh, they telephoned the king at the time. Uh, I'm not sure who was the king. I think it was King Khalid. They telephoned the king. The king sent airplane with medical staff However, the weather was very bad in Qasim that night. They couldn't land the plane and the Sheikh died close to the time of Fajr on the Thursday. And he was buried on the Thursday after, after, after Salat al-Dhahr in the, the graveyard of Unayza. Where now his student Ibn Uthaymin is also buried in the same graveyard of Unayza. That's just a little bit about Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Sa'adi. Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Sa'adi wrote this book as the primer, as the first book for somebody who will study his fiqh and also as the book that somebody can follow in their daily lives. So, the first book that they can study from and, the, and a book that they can follow in their daily life. He covered all of the aspects of fiqh, all of the different issues to do with fiqh, except for the issues of jihad. He didn't mention in this book, the book of jihad. Every other issue to do with fiqh was mentioned in, in this book, but except for the book of jihad. He says, he starts with the khutbatul al haja Should we start the book? Or, you don't, or it's too late? Start? Oh. I don't want to keep everybody here. <coughs> okay, the Sheikh starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. He says, uh, starts with the Khutbah al-Hajjah, Alhamdulillah, Nahmadu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'afiru wa natubu ilayhi wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina man yahdihi allah fala mudhilla la wa man yudlil fala hadiya la wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allah wa ahdahu la sharika la wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, we all know Khutbah al-Hajjah. Then, Amma Ba'd. We hear this often. Amma Ba'd. Amma Ba'd. Amma Ba'd. What does it mean, Amma Ba'd? Good question. What does it mean? To proceed, okay. That's the translation of it. But what's it used for Amma Ba'd? After the praise of Allah, we say Amma Ba'd. Mm -hmm, yes. Pay attention. Pay attention? Maybe. It's to show that you're moving from one thing to another thing. You're moving from one topic to another topic. 
We start it as the brothers say, with the praise of Allah and sending salam to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now we're moving from that to actually what we're going into. They say in Arabic, min intiqal min shay ila shay. It's used, intiqal min shay ila shay. That I'm moving from one thing to another thing. So he says, فَهَذَا كِتَابٌ مُخْتَصَرٌ فِي الْفِقْ This is a, a simple summarized book of fiqh. This is a simple summarized book of fiqh. What is fiqh? Question. What is fiqh? Fiqh is science. Knowledge. Yes, it's a science. It's a Knowledge. It's legislation. It's legislation, it's law. Understand. It's understanding. Yeah. Good. Fiqh in the language means understanding. Faqiha, yafqahu, fiqhan means to understand something. To understand something. Some say it's a, in, it's a deep understanding of something. Some say it's a deep understanding of something. But generally, in the language, it means to understand something. Okay, that's what it means in the language. The Sheikh will tell us what it means in the Sharia. The Sheikh says, so this is a simple book of fiqh in which I put together the issues and the proofs of fiqh. The issues, every issue of fiqh with its proof. So he's mentioned the masail and the dalail. Okay, I've mentioned in this book all the issues concerning fiqh and added to them their proofs. Because that's what knowledge is. Knowledge is not just to know the issues, but it's to know the proofs. The proof is more important. Where did, the, where did these issues come from? What are they based upon? Why is this halal? Why is this haram? That's knowledge. That's true knowledge. Uh, then he says himself, لِأَنَّ الْعِلْمَ مَعْرِفَةُ الْحَقْ بِدَلِيلِهِ because knowledge, true knowledge, is to know the truth by its proof. That's knowledge. لِمَعْرِفَةُ الْحَقْ بِدَلِيلِهِ To know the truth with its proof. Then, he's, then he explains what fiqh actually is. Fiqh is مَعْرِفَةُ الْأَحْكَامَ الشَّرِعِيَّةَ الْفَرْعِيَّةَ بِعَدِلَّتِهَا مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ وَالْإِجْمَاعِ وَالْقِيَاسِ الصَّحِيحِ okay, That's fiqh. Fiqh is to know the Islam, particular Islamic rulings with their proofs from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah, the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and the consensus of the Ummah and the correct analogy. Okay, what's fiqh? Fiqh is to know the particular far'iyya, particular shar'iyya, particular Islamic rulings. Particular Islamic rulings. Bi'adillatiha. With their proofs. Bi'adillatiha. Where are these proofs found? Fil kitab. In the book of Allah. In the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu But what sunnah? What sunnah? We have, we have sunnah sahih. And we have sunnah hasan. We have sunnah daif. We have sunnah mawdu. Which sunnah are we going to take? Sahiha. Sahiha, we put together Hassan and Sahih together because they're both authentic. So the correct, the authentic sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Al Ijma, consensus. Consensus of the Ummah. Because the Prophet Sallallahu said that this Ummah cannot unite upon misguidance. So when the Ummah on an issue unites, then that is the truth. That is the truth. So the consensus and al qiyas al sahih the correct analogy. The correct analogy. What is qiyas? Anybody know what qiyas is? Uh, assumption. On the, on the, on the rulings of the Quran and Hadith, and then according to the situation, we assume that it could happen like this. Mm, kind of. Good, applying, we have a ruling from the Book of Allah on the Sunnah of the Prophet on a certain issue. Say this issue on this thing, for example, uh, okay, 
in the Sharia, we're not allowed to take any intoxicants. Any, any, we can't drink alcohol. We can't drink alcohol. What is the reason why we can't have alcohol? Because it's, it, it removes your mind. So we look at drugs. There's nothing in the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that says explicitly that we can't take drugs. However, we say drugs and alcohol are similar. Yes, they're similar. How are they similar? They remove your faculty of reasoning. They intoxicate you. Therefore, because they have the same, what they call illa, the same reasoning behind it, we can say that just like alcohol is haram, drugs are haram. That's analogy. Qiyas. Clear? That's Qiyas. I haven't confused anyone now. Okay. But the correct Qiyas, it has to be correct. It has to follow which we would learn in books of Asul al-Fiqh. And then the Shaykh carries on. So again, let's go through what is Fiqh. Linguistically, in the, in the language, what is Fiqh? No, no, in the language. Oh. Understanding. Or profound or deep understanding. What is it in the Sharia? Particular Islamic rulings. Particular Islamic rulings with their proofs. With their proofs from the Book of Allah, the Sunnah, the correct Sunnah, the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and the Ijma and the Qiyas Sahih, the correct Qiyas. Then the Sheikh says in this book, I only will mention when I'm mentioning proofs, I will only mention the famous proofs or the easiest proofs to mention because I don't want to make the book long. He could have, rahimahullah, mentioned all the proofs on every issue. But he wanted to make it easy for the students, so he mentioned the main, the main proof for an issue. And he won't talk of anything more than that. He'll give you maybe one proof. He'll give you one eye of the Qur'an. Or he'll give you one hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. And then he'll move on. And then the Shaykh says in this book, if the issue that I'm talking about in this book is an issue scholars have differed. If the issue of this book that I'm talking about is an issue of difference of opinion, then I will only mention the opinion which I regard to be correct. indi. What I regard to be correct. Following the proofs of the book of Allah and the Sunnah, following the proofs of the Sharia. Yeah. Taba'an lil adilla Sharia. Okay, then he mentions Ahkam al Khamsa. In fiqh, everything falls under five things. And we all know these things. Something is either wajib, or it's masnoon, or it's mubah. Or it's what? Makruh. Or it's haram. Do we have anything else? Anybody want to give me a new one? Want to make up a new, a new lot? No. We have five. Except for the Hanafi, they have seven. They have seven. Do they have seven? I think they have seven. They have faridah, fard, wajib, masnoon, mubah, makruh, kirah, tanzih, makruh, kirah, tahrim, and haram. So they have seven. Yeah. Except the Hanafis, they have seven. But we're not going to mention the seven. We're only going with five. The majority opinion is five. Do you have a question? No. Wajib. What is wajib? Obligatory. Obligatory. Okay, what does it mean? Compulsory. It's compulsory. Okay, what does that mean? You, have to you, have to do. Do. you must do it. Okay, and if you don't do it, what happens? You, have, you, are, you may be punished. Remember, may be punished. Sinful. You're sinful, but it doesn't mean you will, without doubt, be punished. Allah forgives sins. Okay, that's what you say, and you are under the threat of punishment. So that's what the Sheikh says. It's what the one who does it is rewarded, and the one who does leaves it is under the threat of punishment. 
Okay? And haram is its opposite. <laughs> haram is its opposite. What's that mean? Haram is its opposite. Good. If you leave it, you're rewarded for it. If you leave it, seeking the reward with Allah, you're rewarded for it. If you leave it because you can't do it, even though you try your hardest, you don't get a reward from Allah for that. For example, somebody leaves zina. Yes, he leaves zina, seeking the reward with Allah, fearing his punishment. Another person leaves zina because nobody wants to make zina with him. Even though he tries his hardest. Okay, will he get reward for that? No. So leaving, an ish, leaving something has to be left seeking the reward with Allah and, staying, and trying to stay away from his, away from his, his anger. Imtithalan li amrillah. Okay. Masnoon or mustahab. What's that? Recommended. What does that mean? Sunnah. Okay, sunnah. Okay, what? Well, give me. If you do if you do it, you're rewarded for it. If you do it, just for the sake of doing it, for the sake of Allah. Remember that. If you do it for the sake of Allah, you are rewarded for it. If you don't do it, you're not punished for it. Okay. Makru is its opposite. Makru is its opposite. What does that mean? Dislike, Makru is dislike. What does that mean? If you leave it, if you leave it, yes, you will get reward. You're missing a part. Seeking the reward with Allah or for the sake of Allah, you will get reward. Remember, all to do with intention. Intention. And if you do it, if you do the Makru, what happens? No, if you do a makro, something which is not haram, there's no, sin. there's no sin. You're not sinful for it. You won't be punished for it. It's possible, yes, it can lead you into haram. So it's best to stay away from things with a makro. But something that's a makro, but there's no delay that they makro. They say the scholars will say that such and such. We'll read it even in the book. Such and such an action is makro. Making wudu, it's a classical example, making wudu with zamzam is makruh. Scholars say, making wudu with zamzam is makruh. Making wudu with water which has been heated by the sun is makruh. Making siwak while you're fasting is makruh. After zawal. Okay, these are things they say makruh. But the, the delete doesn't go with it. Mubah. <coughs> we had wajib, haram, masnoon, makruh, mubah. What's mubah? What's left? Something that's allowed. Something which is allowed. Something which is open. Something? Okay. What does that mean? So if there's no reward, no. If you do it, no there's no reward. If you, if you do it, there's no reward. If you leave it, there's no sin. There's nothing. Neither way. But you can make a mubah action rewardful. How? Intentions. By intention. Okay. Eating. Okay. Eating food. Is that wajib, haram, masnoon, makruh, mubah? It's wajib to eat food. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, yeah, you have to eat. <laughs> I thought you'll die. You're right. You are right. You have to eat. I thought you'll die. If you're in that state, yes, you're right. If I'm in that state, for example, if somebody's in the desert and there's no water and there's no food except for something which is dead, which is meter, which has not been sacrificed, and then the person still doesn't eat it, then he's sinful. Because it's wajib upon him to eat. Because he's not allowed to allow himself to die. So 
he must eat that dead animal to keep himself alive. And if he doesn't do so, then he dies sinful. Okay, uh, okay, yes. But generally, eating is mubah. Okay? How do I make that eating mubah into something rewardful? Good. Eating. I'm eating this food to gain energy so I can worship Allah. If you eat the food that Prophet Sallallahu liked, trying to follow his sunnah, then you're rewarded for that. Yes. Okay. Any questions on those? No? Everything clear? Okay, then the Sheikh says, ويجب على المكلف أن يتعلم من الفقه كل ما يحتاج إليه في عباداته ومعاملاته ويجب from واجب it's واجب upon every person مكلف مكلف is us we are all مكلفين we have to do the actions people who have to do the actions مكلف it's واجب upon him upon us to learn of fiqh that which we need to worship. That which we need to worship Allah. That's wajib upon us. What do we need to know? We need to know how to clean ourselves. We need to know how to make wudu. We need to know how to make ghusl. We need to know how to pray. We need to know how to fast. We need to know how to give zakat. We need to know how to make hajj. No one? MashaAllah. <laughs> Imam Malik used to say, that before somebody goes out and starts a business, he has to learn everything to do with mu'amalat, everything to do with business transactions. Before he can even start a business, he needs to know the halal and the haram of business before he can start a business. Even if the business, he said, even if the business was selling bread, even if the business was selling bread, he has to know the halal and the haram of it. Some of us, we don't know the halal and haram of salah. Forget about mu'amalat. Allah musta'al. And then he mentions the hadith. Okay, also. Mu'amalat <coughs> is dealings. We have dealings of business, we have dealings of something else as well. Social aspects. The family, the wife, the children. All of that also falls under mu'amalat, the dealings. Also, dealings between the st- with the state also falls under that. Dealings with a warring nation falls under that. Dealings of war all fall under mu'amalat. Some, peop- some scholars put it with ibadat, but the majority of scholars put kitab al-jihad, the issues of jihad, with mu'amalat, dealings how we deal with an enemy state. And then the Sheikh mentions, and we're going to stop here, the hadith, مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّحُ فِي الدِّينِ The one whom Allah wishes good for, He gives him the understanding of the religion. I don't know. I don't know. I think it is. Because a lot of books of uh, Abdul Rahman Sa'adi are translated. Okay, when it first came about, when it first came about, I don't know how many years ago, when they first started smoking, the scholars didn't know at that time the harm of smoking. The only thing they could see from smoking was the smell. So they made qiyas of the smell with that of the smell of onions and uh, of uh, thom, garlic. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the smell, uh, the person who eats garlic or eats onion, then don't come to, our, to the masjid because of the smell. So they made analogy between that and smoking. And they said, in that sense, because these are makru actions, then smoking is makru. But then later, when they discovered all the badness that smoking does and how it kills people, the majority of the ulama said that it is haram. Allahu Akbar. It's a waste of a lot of things, but wasting money, 
It's haram. We do it a lot. Of, we do it a lot of the time, <laughs> wasting money. <laughs> but because of more so of the what it does to you, the cancers it causes, the destruction of your body. It's haram. Wallahu a'lam. Allah knows best. Yeah. Shellfish. That would be the Hanafi opinion, because the Hanafi scholars they regard uh, the only sea animal that you can eat are fish, or something which is like fish. They have to look like fish. Anything that doesn't look like fish, according to the Hanafis, you're not allowed to eat. But the rest of the ulama, the rest of the schools of thought say no. Anything that lives its life in the sea all the time. The sea is its, its place of living. If it dies without, if it dies by itself, then it's allowed to be eaten. Or it dies by taking it out of the water, it's allowed to be eaten. Or it's from the. Get what I'm saying. Mm. Lobsters are fine, prawns are fine, all these. Crabs. crabs all of these things are fine, according to the, the majority of the scholars. But if you're Hanafi, then you can't eat that. Sometimes they say that the animals can live in the water. Yes. Yes, it's called uh, in Arabic they call barmai. Barmai. Bar in Arabic means land. Mai means water. So they put it together, barmai. Like a frog. Frog. Uh, sea lion, they say as well. Sea lion. Yeah, sea lion. It spends time in the water and it spends time outside. So they, they say we look at the majority of its time. The majority of its time. The majority of the time is spent normally by most of these creatures outside of the water. Penguin. Penguin. <laughs> penguin. <laughs> no, you have to make a zab of a penguin. You can eat it. There's nothing it's stopping you from snake. eating it. But can you, can you eat it? A sea snake. Then? A sea snake. Yeah. No, it's not. It's hard in that principle is that it lives in the majority of time in the water. But they, they say it's mustakhbath. It's something that the people don't like. And when people, when the majority of people find this hatred for this thing, then you don't, you don't eat that thing. It's called mustakhbath. They have the, like a frog as well, they say it's mustakhbath. People don't like to eat it. So we don't, we say it's not allowed to be eaten. Allahu Akbar. We'll come to that in the books of food, what you can and what you can't eat and what you can and can't drink.